Hey there, and welcome to part two of how to improve your renders with the movie RenderQ. So over the past week, many of you reached out to me with some issues you've had and your renders weren't working, and it's been a real pleasure helping you guys out. So if at any point during this video you have a question, don't hesitate to leave a comment down below and I'll get back to you as soon as I possibly can. So in this video, we're going to be talking about a few hidden tools, some quality of life settings, but most importantly, I really want to touch base on a few limitations that the movie RenderQ has now, I'm not saying that you can't use it in production because it is production ready, but it's really good to know about the limitations because they could very well end up blindsiding you at the end of a production. So enough talking, let's go. All right, so one of the big limitations that, and something you should really be aware of when it comes to using Movie Render Queue has to do with the object IDs when using subsampling. So anti-aliasing subsampling. So as you can see here, I've got my render setting from the Movie Render Queue. All we're running is an EXR sequence, 16-bit. I've got anti-aliasing to none. And I'm going to set the sample to about 32, all right? And I've got my console variables uh, here in order to get some proper subsampling, some proper results. This is what we, we covered this in the previous video. So we're going to go ahead and add the object IDs limited tag here. All right, so this means that we're going to be rendering out a, an object ID pass with some high quality subsampling. Now, the issue that you have here is when you use subsampling, the render times are going to increase astronomically. So let's go ahead and render this right now, and you'll see what I mean. I'm going to hit render local, and you can see right now already it's hanging. Like it tends to hang around the 13 subsamples. I'm just rendering 15 frames here, and you can see. It just kind of just hangs a lot. It's really slow. Now, this is not a, this is normal. It has a lot of data to write to disk, and the more objects you've got in your scene, the longer it's going to be, most likely. So, <clears throat> this is not a problem in itself. The renders you're going to get out of this are going to be very high quality. However, you should just be aware that your renders are not going to be as fast as they normally are. They're going to be substantially slower. So, as you can see, I'm, I've only rendered three frames now, and it's already been... 40 almost 45 seconds so <clears throat> it's just something to be very much aware of because this can really screw you over in the middle of a production you're counting and your renders being reasonably fast you've got a deadline and all of a sudden oh hey our crypto pass or our, our object id pass is just taking way too long to render now you know so once again not a major problem in itself and you know in my opinion it's actually worth the wait because the quality is that much better but you just really need to be aware of just how much longer it takes to render these shots. So you guys might be wondering, well, hey, of course it's going to take longer to render because you're rendering your subsamples. Yes, I'm aware of that. But the hanging that we just saw in the just now has to do with cryptomat or object IDs only. So we're going to go ahead and delete the object IDs path, and we're still going to render with 32 temporal sample counts. Okay, so it's going to be the same amount of samples as previously with uh, no anti-aliasing and the console variables are all here once again in 16-bit exr the only difference is i'm not rendering the object id pass and you'll see right now just how much faster and how smooth it is so i'm going to go ahead and hit render local and look at those samples climbing up there's no hanging whatsoever boom one two frames three frames out and so you can see there's no hanging the hanging that we saw it's only cryptomat related. So you can go ahead and safely use the subsample rendering for better quality renders, but just keep in mind that if you use object ID, it's going to be much slower. All right, so let's jump into Photoshop real quick and look at our cryptomat or object ID path that we just rendered out now. So looking at our object ID path here, I've got the ferns mask right here. Now let's zoom in a little bit. We can see that with rendering with subsample, we got a nice clean motion blur. So the cryptomat or object ID takes motion blur into account. But if you look carefully, you'll notice there's another problem. There's another big problem. Now notice how completely out of focus these ferns are. But take a look at this ferns here. Look at this mask. Let's zoom in a little bit so you can see more clearly. So if you look carefully, you know, if I toggle this, you'll see that the object ID path, the mask that we get, does not actually cover the entire range. It doesn't, the depth of field is not working. Now to see more clearly, I'm going to go to this pot here and look at this mask here. Look how out of focus the pot is compared to the mask. Now, if I select this edge here, you'll see 
Look at this edge selection compared to the out of focusness of the pod itself. Look at this mask. I cannot use this. This is actually unusable. This is this is useless. So we can conclude that depth of field is not taken into consideration when you render object ID passes. Motion blur works, but not depth of field. Now, normally in a VFX production, this would not be a problem, and I'll show you why. So in a typical VFX production approach, step one would be to render the following passes. You're going to render out your beauty pass, you're going to render out your crypto mat or object ID pass, and you're going to render out a 32-bit Z depth. Now, of course, you're going to be usually be rendering a lot more passes than this. There's, there's so many more other AOVs or render paths that you give to compositors. But to keep it simple, I'm going to keep it limited to these three. Step two is you apply the depth of field or defocus in Nuke, Premiere, or After Effects, Resolve, whatever, with the Z depth render pass. So all the depth of field out of the, all the defocusing is done in post. You don't actually do it in the render. Why is that? Because in Arnold or Redshift, V-Ray, whatever, rendering depth of field is super time consuming. It takes much, much longer to render with depth of field than it is to just apply the depth of field in post. You have way more control doing it in Nuke. It's way faster to do it in Nuke. So that's why we do it that way. All that is made possible because of the 32-bit Z depth pass. Now that brings me to my next point. So another gripe that I've had with the movie Render Queue so far after using it for a week is the lack of 32-bit support. Now, as you can see here, we have got EXR sequence 16-bit. For most cases, this is going to be more than enough, especially with the subsampling. Um, you don't need 32-bit color data, but it, we want 32-bit depth. Uh, we want a proper 32-bit floating point data because it's just going to give you that much better result. Now, if you use the sequencer, we're going to go to the sequencer tab here, right? We're going to go to render this video and custom render passes here you can do scene depth world units and this is actually a, a z depth a z depth pass if you capture frames in hdr it technically renders it out uh as a 32-bit exr but because we're using sequencer you lose the benefit of the subsampling you don't get the high quality render that the movie render queue offers with sequencer um sequencer is kind of handicapped in that respect but it does offer a 32-bit Z depth path. It's not very good, especially around along the edges. So if let's say you've got a character and detail behind him, the edge of the character is going to be really bad, especially when you get motion blur um, and lots of effects and stuff like that. So Z depth is still not quite there yet. Don't get me wrong. The movie Render Queue is a great step forward. It's gone leaps and bounds from Sequencer, but we don't, looking here in the, in the movie render queues, um, render passes here, we don't have a proper Z depth. And that, that, that really sucks. This would make, for me, that would make the movie render queue the complete package, but unfortunately it's not. Um, this is once again, this is a great release, amazing feature that we can get with subsampling, but it's not quite there yet. Now, one nice little feature that I'm using all the time, and that's the little presets button up here. Now, you may or may not have seen this already, but I think I should mention it anyway. If you've got, you know, a lot of stuff set out here, especially console variables, you know, you got a long list of things that you don't want to have to go find online, copy paste every single time. You know, you, you've elaborately set up your, your render path and everything, your resolution, and you don't want to change it every single time you render a shot, you can save a preset. So you can just click on the preset button up here, save as preset, you choose where you want to save it, click save, and there it is. Now, every single time you want to add a new job, let's go ahead and let's delete this right here. So let's say I'm gonna go, let's say I'm gonna go ahead and add burn in PNG sequence and object IDs here, okay? So I got a very complex thing. I can go ahead and click presets, save as preset, and then say preset William, save. And now you can kind of go get whatever preset you want every single time without having to re-enter your data. This is not a groundbreaking trick, but it's good to know. Now, the last thing we're gonna talk about, and this little trick here is the main reason I made this video to begin with, and this is the neat little tool that I'm going to use all the time. This is going to save me so much time. And that feature is, well, the render queue, okay? I didn't cover this in my first video, I'm covering it now. It, it should go without saying, it says it in the name, a render queue. 
So as you can see, we've got map one, shot one here. I've gone ahead and I've made two other shots. So we're gonna go ahead and click the render button here. We're gonna add shot two, and we're gonna add shot three. Now, before with Sequencer, you had to open up the, the map, click the button down here, render this video, capture movie, wait for it to render. Then you had to, you know, open up the next map, capture movie, open up the next map, and so on and so forth. You had to do this for every single shot. It was an extremely time-consuming process. Um, if you wanted to, if you had 50 shots to render, you were going to be up all night, opening it up every single map and running them out. But now with the movie render queue, and this should go without saying because it says it in the name render queue, you can go ahead and just add all these. And now because we have presets made, you can kind of just go ahead and configure these. So we can have preset William here or, you know, the regular preset that I have here, choose their output and just render everything in one go. This seems obvious, but if you don't already know about this, this is going to make your life so much easier. So all you need to do next is just hit render local and let it rip. And now shot two. And shot three. So as you can see, you don't need to open up those maps anymore. You can just go at it from one window and render out your entire sequence, whether it's you know two shots or a hundred shots. This saves me a colossal amount of time. I am so thankful for this neat little feature. So as always, I hope this has helped you guys out. If you have any questions whatsoever, don't hesitate to leave a comment down below. I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you guys next week.